Thank you all for joining us today for a new session of the GECC webinar series. The GECC webinar series serves as a platform for the GECC network members to share experience and expertise in evidence synthesis and to learn about potential collaboration. My name is Zahra Saad. I'm a research assistant at the GECC Secretariat, and I will be moderating the session today. So before we begin, and if you are using the GoToWebinar for the first time, as you might have noticed, you are automatically muted. So if you would like to submit any comment or ask any question, please use the tab on the right. And if you would like to comment and address our presenter directly, uh, you can use the raise your hand button and we can unmute you so that you can discuss directly with our presenter. Today's session is about rethinking communication, storytelling for stakeholder engagement in environmental evidence synthesis. And our presenter is Annelie Sandin. Annelie works with science communication at the Stockholm Environment Institute. It's an international nonprofit research and policy organization that tackles environment and development challenges. She supports research projects with advice, planning, and delivery of professional, tailored, and strategic communication activities. Annelie has a background in environmental science, resilience, and sustainability. Annelie loves working together with researchers to find the most efficient and fun ways to communicate science. Hello, Anani. Yes, hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And uh, thank you also to the GESI initiative for inviting me to, to talk at this webinar. Uh, it's, uh, very, I'm very happy to be here. Looking forward to uh, a really interesting uh, hour. We're happy to have you with us as well. Thank you. Super. <clears throat> and thank you for the introduction. Um, as as you heard, I uh, I work at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, I've been working here for the past five years or so with science communication. Um, and and beyond my everyday. Uh, work with supporting research projects with tailored uh, communication. I also really enjoy giving trainings on how to, to craft um, and also deliver key messages uh, and also to, to explore um, what actually works in uh, science commu communication. So what is called the, the science of science communication. And that includes uh, storytelling. And that's what's brought me here because as part of that uh, work, uh, me uh, together with two colleagues here at SEI, Caroline Andersson and Robert Watt, uh, we were invited to write a commentary paper for a stakeholder engagement special series in the environmental evidence journal uh, back in 2018. Uh, uh, and that was focusing on trying to, to revamp uh, science communication in systematic review processes, looking at storytelling uh, specifically, um, in what way storytelling can uh, contribute to, to an increased engagement among uh, actors and end users. Uh, and, Wait, I'm just going to try and change the slide. There we go. So these, I hope you can see them. These are my um, talking points of, of today. Uh, we're in the at the end of the introduction now, and then I'll um, I'll talk a little bit about storytelling because I'm sure many of you work with science communication are very familiar with storytelling, but I think it's important to to talk about it and. Uh, uh, explain a little bit the history of it and um, also some definitions and uh, the kind of the paradox that is there is a debate around it today 
of using narratives uh, when communicating science. Uh, and then uh, we will go over to talk about what's in our commentary paper, the proposed uh, framework that um, we suggest can be used for systematic review processes. And then I'll just conclude with some, some takeaways that I, I wish you to bring with you uh, after this webinar. And um, uh, I think uh, Sarah mentioned that you can um, uh, easily contribute to, to the webinar and ask questions and give comments. Uh, Sarah, did you want to say something more about that? Uh, yeah, there is the question uh, the panel tab. Um, it appears to the attendees. They can either type in their question or any comment they have. I can read it out loud. Or there's a raise your hand button option where they can press it and I can unmute them so that they can uh, ask their question verbally and directly to you. That is great. So I will present, but people are very welcome to ask questions or come with uh, comments during this time. And uh, if you do, as Sarah suggested, that you, you raise your hand and you want to say something, please uh, introduce yourself very briefly, if you wish. But we will also, at the end, uh, have a section where you, we can get to discuss the topic and ask more questions. And I actually might have some questions for you. Um, and we also have some, a couple of uh, polls embedded in the webinar uh, throughout. So, um, I would like to start off with what you could potentially call a, a story. Uh, it's a GIF that we, oh, me again, there we go. Um, that might be very familiar to some of you, depending on what uh, science field you are working in. As you can see, it's a GIF, a moving image and it's showing the global temperature change. Uh, this is actually slightly old. There are uh, newer one of these with data up until 2019, but it's showing the average uh, temperature change from 1850 to 2017. Um, and what it's called, it's, it's called the climate spiral. Um, and uh, it, will, it was developed by a climate scientist called Ed Hawkins in, in the UK, and it was tweeted out as a GIF, just like this. And in a few days, it had had ten thousands of uh, retweets and uh, a huge readership. Uh, and, and all it is is it is a spiral. Why why is it so popular? And you're very welcome here to to comment on this if you think what is it that uh, draws your attention to it, please feel free to contribute. And Sarah, you keep, keep an eye on the chat or on the question if, if someone uh, gives any comments. But what it is is that it's something different, right? It's something we're not used to. Um, and brains, our brains are very good in detecting novelty. And it's also very immediate. It's it's familiar and immediate. It, you know, it's the sh same shape of a of a clock, um, and and it's a moving image. So actually, your uh, your brain doesn't have to do much of the thinking. It's uh, the eyes, your eyes that do the processing and understanding, and it's done automatically compared to if you were just looking at this data in static bar charts um, so uh, it, and it also has a metaphorical perspective to it as well that this is something you could say something that is spiraling out of control uh, which is what we see today with with uh, climate change right um, and without even knowing it in the beginning uh, ed hawkins he produced something um, that made people uh, connect with it in a much better way. So these static charts and diagrams, you could call them that they are data uh, or they are stories without a spirit or out, without a soul. And here he actually added a bit of soul to it um, and made it much more comprehensive uh, or understandable. 
uh, among lay audiences. But what is what is actually storytelling? Um, it's something you know we uh, were telling stories before we could write or read. It's it's always been considered kind of an art form. Uh, with a purpose to, to educate and inspire and communicate uh, cultural traditions, uh, history, values. And today we know it's an extremely, it's a well known and extremely powerful means of uh, communicating messages and engaging uh, with audiences. Um, and the last decade or even uh, yeah, further back, uh, we have been seeing how storytelling um, have been booming in certain sectors such as the marketing sector but we also see that in recent years there's an increase in using storytelling in different scientific fields such as um, uh, the, the health science field or science education however um, i think it's important to to note and remember that this is something that has been uh, discussed um, and debated uh, for several decades. Um, back in the, I think, 60s, 70s, there was this American scholar named Jerome uh, Bruner. He was criticizing the Western uh, society, uh, that uh, the Western society was putting in so much effort in, in, in the scientific kind of logical um, way of approaching uh, thinking and knowledge. And this quote, uh, the choices we make in telling stories become so habitual that they finally become recipes for structuring experience itself, for laying down roots into memory. It's from uh, this scholar Brunner. Um, he, you know, he expressed that narratives are what we use to understand the world around us. And since then, there's been so much research on this. Uh, uh, and also um, uh, brain science, brain research, uh, showing how we are often thinking in, in, in a narrative way. Uh, before we move on, I thought uh, we should just, uh, or I will just go through some of the definitions or some of the terms that I'm using and that are being used. I sometimes use story and narrative interchangeably, uh, but uh, they, they are actually considered uh, different things. So story is uh, a structured account of events or of people, uh, and it has these very familiar um, uh, story elements, you can call them. Uh, the, the setting, there's a plot, there are characters, there's usually a protagonist and then maybe an antagonist, and there's a sequence of events. So while a narrative is more the actual sequence of events um, organized into a story, so they can come uh, in a certain order and they relate to each other, uh, and if you change the order of these events, then you've changed the narrative, but not necessarily the story itself. So it's kind of a um, representation of the story. And anecdotes, um, they are simply there to illustrate a point. They can be, it can be just a moment, something that happens, uh, a lesson, something that is amusing, life-changing or tragic. Um, and that's actually, that means that we're uh, now up for the first poll. So I think Sarah will will help me and we're quite a few attendees so it would be great if you engage and answer this poll. Uh, I think it comes up on your screen. It's on, on now right Sarah? Uh, yes, attendees are already answering. Oh great. So oh, yeah, have you recently read results from a scientific study in a distinct narrative form? That is this first poll. It would just be interesting. 
and there's no we can wait a couple of more seconds and then we can close the poll and we can share the results yeah I think someone has added a comment right in the questions. Is that correct, uh, Sarah? Uh, yeah, we have a comment from Angelica. It says that it is easy to understand. Yeah, she's probably referring to the to the stories. Yeah. Mm. Eight. Yeah, people are still voting a bit. Yeah. It's working. <laughs> and um, Angelica also commented that she was uh, talking about the spiral graph. Ah, yeah, 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 exactly. And it has its reasons to that it is easy, you know, because of the, these things I was saying that it's kind of intuitive and uh, the eyes uh, the, do most of the uh, understanding automatically. So that, thank you for that, Angelica. So we- I will close the poll now. Yeah. Ah. And share the results. Yeah. 50-50. 50% 50 have recently heard some results being a uh, research results being described uh, in a, a very distinct narrative form a 50 percent haven't um we could uh, we could remove that poll or is that me who does that hmm? maybe I'll, I'll wait for you to do it what i um so a comment i often get is that uh, from researchers is that <clears throat> but actually what we are doing sometimes when we're writing our scientific papers is that we are, are using a narrative structure. And I would agree that that is true to just a certain extent. You are following some kind of uh, narrative structure with starting off with the background and having a, a results section and which are with some common parts of a scientific paper usually from a well, based on a scientific study and you have a conclusion uh, recommendation conclusions part but you are um, really missing uh, these story elements to to make it more um, compelling um, then you're missing these important uh, elements such as the the climax the the, the top bit the resolution um, for example uh, but uh, on the Apologies, other hand, Apologies, Annabelle, for the interruption. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, but we have um, Tony Denso with us, and he would like to address a question to you. So I will unmute him now, ah. if you would like. Y yeah. Do you want to read it out, or shall I? Hi there. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I just wanted to know the numbers involved in there polling that we just had because it's a 50 50 i don't know who, how many people are participating in this now so that we know of course because, um, two out of four is 50 and it's not the same as when the number is high so how many of us are participating thank you tony uh, there, there was uh, there, there's on, there's 15 attendees of this webinar i was thinking that maybe you see it now if you okay. don't so 15 in total um okay. Uh, so that it's it, it, this poll is just more for fun to uh, test you a little bit and see what who has actually heard about storytelling being used in science communication. Okay. Uh, it was more uh, for that reason. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you too. I will make sure to mention that in the next poll. Okay. Um. Yes, I'll I'll move on. Um, so it, oh, the last thing I was going to say there that of course scientific articles can uh, can be very well written and could be more populous science or yeah use less jargon and 
um, shorter sentences and uh, clearer language in, in, in some ways and maybe add some of those story elements. I think there's definitely potential for that and that's something we could discuss later on as well. Um, however, uh, it's very important to, to raise a bit of caution as well. Uh, let me just go to the next slide. There we go. Um, there is a paradox of, of using storytelling, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, we know that uh, there are huge benefits of using storytelling for science communication uh, because of, of the brain science that is out there. The brains, our brains have a uh, fantastic ability to adopt and remember narrative messages. And actually there are many parts of the brain uh, that are activated when you're listening to a story uh, more than when you're just reading out, reading facts, listed facts that are listed in a, in a scientific article, for example. And uh, the hormone dopamine is being released in the brain when we're listening or reading or taking in something that makes us um, emotionally charged, which stories usually do. And this actually helps us to remember better with better accuracy. And then for people who have uh, low numeric uh, literacy, uh, struggling with numbers, which there are many people out there, including myself, uh, then uh, it, it's usually much, much easier to take in information through a story rather than uh, data displayed in charts or diagrams. Uh, so when we wish to inform and uh, engage, it's really a great tool, but it's important to be aware of that not one really needs to be careful uh, in the way we use storytelling. Uh, I'm sure no one has missed that we are in the age of fake news um, and disinformation and we are seeing constantly how many populist leaders, both political or uh, other types of leaders, are using narratives to sway their voters or their audiences and there is a debate which the scientific, uh, organi scientific organizations, even universities, are starting to engage in uh, around um, how storytelling can actually be dangerous, uh, especially when, when we have science communicators or science journalists or ordinary journalists starting to hype results from uh, scientific studies or even mislead their readers or listeners um, uh, with the way they present uh, data. Um, and there is really a big need to provide some kind of guidelines to help scientists and communicators um, to, to navigate or know that when, when their uh, attempts to engage uh, actually cross the border into this misinformation or the hyping of uh, results. And uh, on top of that, when we want people to actually take on uh, uh, lay people, non-scientists, to take on a scientific or logical reasoning around evidence and research results, then narratives can actually be uh, counterproductive. Uh, and we know that narrative messages, they can be persuasive and that's good. Right? We want uh, them to be persuasive because often in many scientific fields, we want them, we want our audiences to take in what we're telling them and act upon, on, upon the research. Um, so whatever the underlying factual claims, um, there is this, this, still this risk that um, the data or the results can easily become oversimplified or even worse, um, manipulative. Uh, we've, we've seen that is in some very concrete examples are the uh, discussions around vaccines, uh, also with climate change. Uh, and it suggests uh, that science communicators and scientists they must find ways to confront um, the beliefs or the perceptions that sometimes 
is promoting this resistance to science-based communication and recommendations. Um, and um, the scientists need to be aware of unintended consequences that might occur. Uh, and there's some really good papers that I could share on this afterwards, um, talking about intended and unintended consequences of science communication. Uh, however, researchers should not be deterred. Uh, I think it's still very important to encourage scientists to go beyond just informing stakeholders of research um, evidence and actually continue to seek to have an influence, but an influence that is positive and uh, intended. And there are studies from like, the last two years um, where they often combine fields of psychology, neuroscience, narratology, um, and other uh, types of fields such as climate change or health. Uh, where they're looking at what is triggering the positive kind of behavior that you're looking for. Um, and there is one study by Morris et al. from uh, 2019 that implies that we uh, actually should consider presenting information in story structures, um, that it's having a better effect in how, how the audience is receiving um, the information in the, in, from the research. Um, but as I said, I can share this afterwards. So now to go back to um, the paper that we wrote, uh, we um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the recent years, we've seen this increase in using storytelling in different uh, scientific fields, and we went out to look for some of those examples, and you see some of them presented in the table in front of you. Um, and uh, you see that it varies quite a lot how storytelling has been applied, everything from in the health sector, it has been used as a tool um, to highlight the benefits of using systematic reviews, to uh, storytelling being a tool to gather perspectives from uh, uh, people locally, uh, on the experiences and knowledge about drought and its impacts and how to adapt. Um, so there are some uh, really exciting examples out there. Um, and we were focusing on how to incre increase stakeholder engagement in these systematic review processes. And when we looked into that, and we were looking specifically on the in the environmental field and whether storytelling was a common communications method, we hardly found any examples. So we really think that it uh, has yet to reach its potential and needs to be further explored. Uh, and uh, this is our, uh, the framework that we are proposing could be potentially applied in a systematic review which consists of, uh, of two parts, really. Uh, one is uh, in the beginning of the systematic or uh, review or map uh, process, um, where we suggest the storytelling techniques can be applied right at the beginning when the research questions and research plan is being formulated. We call them here contextual narratives. Uh, and they would, of course, be developed in collaboration with the people that have a stake in, in this research project. And these contextual narratives, uh, we think that they can really help researchers or the review team to better understand people's perspectives and uh, prior knowledge. And we believe that it's an approach that can increase engagement and interest and even ownership uh, of the of the review process. Um, and it's it gives the space to the review team to identify if there's an agency of marginalized groups and individuals um, and potentially also help avoid misunderstandings and misperceptions. Uh, 
secondly, as a second part, um, we proposed that the review team could also create a so-called final story, the final storyline that relates to these contextual narratives gathered at the start of the process. So in contrast to the format of the final reports uh, or ways of communicating uh, from an evidence synthesis, where usually information is um, plainly presented, here we hope to be able to generate a, a fuller experience among the stakeholders when you're embedding or grounding it, uh, the findings into a contextually, contextually relevant story. I'm sorry, Anneli. Um, we have yeah. a question from Crystal Perez. Awesome. Um, the question is, is the protocol equivalent to methods? Sorry, I'm thinking from the traditional approach to communicate a research. Um, so I am not a, a systematic review researcher, but the protocol is part of a systematic review process and it's something that you come up with in the beginning before you actually start the evidence synthesis together with uh, the stakeholders. I hope that uh, if there are any systematic review experts, uh, or uh, even Sarah, if you have any comments on, on the protocol, uh, you're very welcome very to... I hear someone. Cool. Sarah, Sarah, did you hear if someone had something to say? Or shall I move on? Hmm. It became very quiet. Sorry, Annalie, I wasn't uh, I wasn't able to listen to anything. I don't know what happened to the speakers. So. Ah, okay. I yeah. wonder. Uh, maybe people can tell us in the chat if they've had problems with the with the internet or with the hearing what we're saying. I hope not. That you. I think it was from my laptop. I don't know what happened. Um, okay. I was just I was just saying that maybe there are other. Uh, people that are doing systematic reviews on a daily basis that could tell us a little bit more what the protocol is. That was it, but um, I think we yeah. can... We have Tony done so. He, he would like to say ah. something. Yeah, I will unmute him. Oh, hi again. <clears throat> yes, I, I just want to know, where is the departure between this storytelling and narrative synthesis? Because to... Uh, Okay, answer me that one. And if there's anything that probably I want to add, is there any departure between this and narrative synthesis? Because from what you have um, depicted over here from the diagram, it means that the final part of narrative synthesis and most of the systematic review that we do, even if it's a narrative synthesis, we have the plain language that communicates the, the evidence in the lay person's uh, point of view. So yes. where is the departure? Is this yes. a, an extension of narrative synthesis or what? I, I'm a bit confused. Can you shed light on it? Mm. I, uh, I, I assume that narrative synthesis is uh, a type of systematic review or evidence synthesis. That's what yeah. you're referring to. Here yeah. we are talking about how to use storytelling, not only a narrative structure, but storytelling yeah. in the beginning of a systematic review and at the end. And if I, uh, if I may continue, I will explain a little bit that, about the end of the systematic review and what we're proposing there. Okay. okay? That's yeah. fine. Cool. Thanks. Uh, yes. So uh, at, uh, let me see where I am. I don't miss anything. So at the at the end, we, um, as I said, we're proposing to uh, that you develop a final story, um, which are based on the, the those contextual narratives that you gathered in the beginning that fed into the question formulation and to the protocol. Um, uh, and the aim is to make um, this story uh, easier to digest, even easier than the plain language that is used today. 
uh, for the stakeholders and other end users. Uh, and where you actually use these elements of, of a story uh, in a much broader sense. Uh, this final story um, could also be a, a building a base for a range of different uh, types of communication products. For example, you can adapt the story uh, and use it in a conference presentation, or you could um, uh, use it as the, the storyline for a video or for a podcast. Um, and I think it's important to mention the contextual narratives or the stories that you gather from stakeholders in the beginning um, that it might be really useful to get some help and use some proper methods. So we are in our paper, we're suggesting that you could even uh, consult a storytelling professional. Depends on the, the context, of course, you can also give stakeholders storytelling templates um, or um, use uh, story cards, story boards, for example. There's also this other uh, excellent communi communication tool called the message box, uh, uh, which was um, developed by a science communication organization in the US called Compass, um, where, where, which is a tool that helps stakeholders to identify and formulate, formulate the relevant problem that is in need of investigation. Um, so that I hope that uh, made it a bit clearer that uh, here we are not proposing using the narrative structure, but actually use story elements uh, and really ground the research results into a, a story that can be used in many different ways. Uh, I'll, before I enter into my last few slides, I would like to just uh, sum up a little bit the, the takeaways that I would like you to bring with you from this uh, webinar. Um, I believe there is uh, there is a recognition that we uh, we are already doing that in many ways. We're starting to think outside the box, uh, even within the networks such as the Center for Environmental Evidence and the Cochrane community, that we need to innovate on the ways we we communicate uh, scientific results. And what we're really encouraging is new um, innovative communication tools to be used uh, by these research networks. And storytelling could be one such tool that could complement um, uh, the traditional portfolio of tools that are being used. Um, I think through a, a story, the context is, is provided to the audience and complex scientific data is easier to understand and analyze by a lay audience. Uh, and in this paper, you know, we've argued for a more systematic and uh, integrated use of such innovative tools such as storytelling from an early stage of systematic reviews or systematic maps uh, to final stages when you are communicating to a wider audience. Um, and on top of that, the very good benefit of that is that you can use um, the final story that you're developing in many different settings and purposes. Of course, we are very aware of, and it's important to acknowledge, um, that the effectiveness of using storytelling uh, as an engagement method, uh, as well as the different types of methods, storytelling methods that are being used, they um, are determined by the type of review that you undertake, the stakeholders that are involved and that is context specific. And we, we propose that further research should be done to understand uh, storytelling as an effective means of science communication. Um, I think, what do I have? I have my second poll actually. Um, Annalise, before we can yeah. launch the poll, there's a question from Richard Morley. 
uh, yeah. Aksana has some questions. Uh, the first one is that, is there a tension between patient stories where there's this only person's experience and what the evidence may suggest based on gathering more data? I have seen decisions made in research priority setting where on one person's personal story is very powerful and has influenced the outcome of priority setting, perhaps disproportionately, and can the stories trump evidence? Mm. Very good uh, question, Richard. Thank you very much. And please feel free to uh, comment further because I know you're also into this field uh, and uh, very uh, knowledgeable on the topic. I, uh, I, this is the, the, the big uh, debate, right? That stories sometimes trump evidence and, uh, and that, that's a problem. And it's a shame when one person's personal story uh, overtakes uh, the science. So I definitely think it's um, it, it's a, a problem uh, and and a, a big tension. And I I really would suggest that we need many stories and we need collective stories. Uh, and how they will look like, uh, I'm yet to explore, but we need more collective stories and um, uh, that brings out the science in the way that has, it, it has a positive uh, response. Uh, so that's, that's my answer. Richard, if you want to add something or if someone else wants to add something to this, please feel free. I think we'll move on. We have another question actually um, from Tony Lenzo. He's asking, is there any systematically synthesized evidence to support the case on the effectiveness of storytelling? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, to my knowledge, there isn't. And I'm actually in my, in a couple of slides, I will bring up uh, this uh, in particular. Um, because we we feel that there is a lack of exactly this uh, some synthesized evidence that uh, actually shows how effective storytelling is. Uh, but I, I'll get back to that when I come to that slide. Uh, so maybe we can do the poll in the meantime. Richard said, I see Richard's comment there. Uh, thank you. Let's do the poll, Sarah. Uh, yes. So, do you think using storytelling for systematic reviews can be useful? And of course, this comes with a lot of reflections and things that I've been discussing already. I mean, you can also answer this question thinking a little bit more broadly. Um, if you think using storytelling in general for scientific communication, uh, if that can be useful as well. So you can think more broadly if you prefer. That's okay. This is just for fun to see what you uh, participants think about this. Now we have around... Uh, around 11, I think, uh, participants uh, voting in the poll. Yes. Ninety-one percent have voted, so there's like one or two people who haven't put their vote. I can take the opportunity to mention that this uh, webinar is being recorded, so you can uh, listen to it afterwards, or you know, if you had to leave early or you missed the beginning, you can always listen afterwards or share it with colleagues that you think uh, would benefit from thinking a little bit outside the box regarding science communication or who, other colleagues that might be interested. I think it will be available 
sometime from next week, right, um, Sarah? Um, yes, possibly in the upcoming two weeks, maximum. Cool. And I will try my best to finish it by next week. Um, I will close the poll now and we can uh, see the results. Yes. Everyone has voted. Well, that was a, 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 a positive outcome, I would say. Everyone thought it can be useful. Um, I I believe so too. If 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 you're aware enough uh, of and uh, you make sure to get the help you need to to use storytelling methods and and different types of formats of storytelling, then I think it can be really uh, useful. Uh, so. Um, and in sorry for the interruption again, but we have an, a question from Tony Denso. Um, I will unmute him. Hi again. Yes, I think my first question has not yet been answered. I don't know if it will be answered at the end. I sort of asked, um, where is the departure uh, be from uh, between this and uh, narrative synthesis? Because from what you have uh, discuss with us presented. I see it is the end part of it. That is the, the after the results that this story, uh, storytelling becomes uh, uh, essential. So the rest you are using systematic review, narrative synthesis approach, formulating your question, protocol, and those things. So where? But and you mentioned that stakeholders engaging stakeholders. That is okay. But even narrative synthesis. I'm quantitative. A person, but my experience in narrative synthesis, even there, you also interact with stakeholders to get information from them to start to build your theories and themes. So I just want to know, is this an extension, is it a means of helping to communicate the evidence or is an entity itself? And, and then after that, the results that this, the last poll that we took, we see the answers are just yes and no. It doesn't give room for us to even to be able to tell what we think the margin of effectiveness. Because now this is, I think this is now evolving. And as I asked that you don't have any systematic reviews or systematically synthesized evidence to show how effective it is. So, mm. Nobody can really give any yes and no. Is yes, probably everybody will say yes because you don't know. And yeah. yes, that so that answer is a bit deceptive. So if you take it that yes, this is a we need more for me to show that this is really working, and we don't have it yet. So if uh, you, I uh, can I comment? Yeah. Um so I I would uh, I was going to get back to um the effectiveness of using storytelling in science communication and for systematic reviews yeah. uh, and um uh, re as to regard to the narrative synthesis and and the work you do in this in the beginning of a systematic review yeah. uh, we are proposing is is, is not uh, to uh, change the way you do the 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 start of the the systematic review process but yeah. to add on different types of storytelling methods to make the engagement even fuller and uh, better okay you are today most likely using different types of stakeholder engagement tools yeah. uh, to get everyone on board and help formulate these research questions and the research plan and, and the problem definition, et cetera. Uh, but we are proposing that you can uh, refine that and use some of these storytelling methods where you're using story elements as part of it to, uh, to gather the, yeah, deeper perspectives. Uh, and uh, due to the fact that storytelling is such a powerful means of communicating. And it's, you know, we are story animals. That's that's the one of the expressions around storytelling. We are thinking in stories. Yeah. So that is what we're proposing. But let me go to my, I think it's the next slide. Uh, some of the next steps, because we have yet to 
to understand, and I totally agree, there, there isn't, as far to my knowledge, there isn't any evidence synthesis on the effectiveness uh, of using different uh, ways, uh, different storytelling formats uh, when you're communicating research. Um, and, and, you know, if you're using one type of storytelling, what are the characteristics of that type? Or that design, um, or if you use storytelling in the protocol stage, what happens when you use it, and what happens with the stakeholder engagement? And uh, we um, have some ideas of this, and we have actually tried to we've tried to get some funding um, to test this because we really would like to understand and empirically test. Uh, how stakeholders are appreciating and engaging in different formats of storytelling. Um, but yeah, if anyone has ideas about how, if there is any uh, work that have been done on this, you're very, very happy to, to share that. But to my knowledge, the, it hasn't been thoroughly tested. And uh, uh, this year we're exploring the, whether we can actually test this framework that we are um, proposing in the commentary paper in a new project here at SEI uh, on uh, water sanitation and hygiene um, and it's specifically ta um, looking at gender and social equality in uh, interventions in uh, WASH and here we were thinking we actually have a great opportunity to apply storytelling uh, in the co-design in the beginning of the systematic review that will be undertaken in this in this project uh, and in the review scope and developing the questions etc as well as towards the end but we're just about to start that uh, exploring how we could uh, could do it but we hope that we that I maybe can come back in a year's time or, or more uh, with more research on this. But please, if anyone has any comments on this or uh, know of any good research out there, I can definitely share you research on uh, storytelling being used as a science communication methods, method uh, in general, not looking at systematic review particularly, uh, but more in general. Um, there's some really good stuff out there. Uh, I think I'll go to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, the GIS Initiative, for hosting this webinar, and thank you everyone for listening and engaging in uh, with questions and comments. Uh, I hope it's been uh, meaningful. And if you have more questions, uh, I realize that we're maybe running out of time. But I hope I can be able to answer or point you to work that has been done by other scholars on this topic. Thank you, Annelie, for this very interesting, uh, it was two very informative and interactive webinar session. Um, in case anyone has any question, please feel free to uh, ask them. We have Samu Samori. Um, I will unmute. Yeah. And please um, introduce introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah, it's me, Samori. I just want okay. to know if you want to okay. share the slide from today. Thank you, Samori. Uh, yes. Yeah. We okay. will definitely. Okay. Uh, I, I okay. actually. Oh, ask, uh, 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 obrigado, yeah, there we go. Um, Sarah, will we be able to send out the slides to the ones that have attended to their email uh, address? Yes, yes, we can do that. Then uh, we will for sure do that. And I will, I will make sure to add uh, some links or some titles of uh, papers uh, that I would recommend you to look at on, on the topic of storytelling um, in, in one of the last slides or so. Um, we also have a comment from Angelica. She says, thank you so much. It was very interesting. Uh, there is also um, Richard Molly. He says, thanks, Annelie. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining.